distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Vukin Vucic. Um, I was in your shoes quite recently, reading textbooks and such, and there are some authors of textbooks where you teach classes and you use these books over and over again, and you think, one day maybe I'll actually meet this person and, and talk to them. For some of you, it might have been Mike Meyer who, who represents that, having used his book in undergrad somewhere and such. Well, I have for years used Dr. Vukinvucic's textbook. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing him uh, now for you guys. Um, and he, so Dr. Vukinvucic is a transit expert, a person who can teach me a lot more than I can even teach you guys in this field. He worked at the University of Pennsylvania for um, a while. <laughs> 44 years. 44 years. They, uh, he founded their transportation systems program, of which James is a graduate, as well as a number of other folks <laughs> who've gone on to prestigious careers throughout our industry. Um, he now travels a bit more than he may be used to, but has over the years lectured at 90 different universities, written a trilogy of books, as well as numerous papers, and is very well renowned in our field. Um, and so today he's going to talk to us about this topic of livability in transportation that um, was a phrase that he had used a long time ago and now has become much more popular. But I think you guys will really enjoy his perspective. So let me turn it over to Dr. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's not another university because I did give a lecture here somewhere in the 1970s or so. <laughs> and I visited Atlanta several more times. Uh, my topic today is uh, a review of urban transportation what we have learned in recent decades and where we stand now, it's a kind of worldwide view. It's a topic that I could easily, more easily give us for a semester rather than for 40 minutes, but I'll try. Uh, um, I'll follow the following, the, 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 this, this outline. First, present condition of Transportation, transportation, where do we stand now? I'll review a little bit what happened during especially the 20th century. Then I'll review the family of urban transportation modes that we have. And then uh, the policies in urban transportation that we uh, follow or should follow. And uh, my main line through the lecture will be that by planning transportation, we have a great impact on cities. Uh, not only the transportation, but really on the form and type of cities. Number five is implementing optimal intermodal uh, transportation systems. If we decide we want to discomposition the mode, how do we achieve that? And then number six is uh, examples of successful planning and review of different groups of cities, how they stand, and finally the conclusions. So, uh, if we look at our present transportation, uh, we have really very high mobility for population now, and we have a great economic and lifestyle benefits from that. We cannot even compare ourselves with 100 years ago, how it was done, or 150 years ago, was drastically different. In spite of this, uh, mobility and so on, we do have some problems also. The quality of service is not always very good. It varies. And it's not only congestion speed, but uh, reliability is something that we want from transportation systems. And of course, if we have congestion, we don't have reliability. We have some inequities in, in uh, transportation, in offering trans uh, transportation services to different groups. Um, and then we have the phenomenon that a former General Motors chairman named collision of cities and towns. How we have problems that uh, we have this unreliable travel, that uh, uh, we build highways and parking garages so much that uh, sometimes they damage the cities, and that uh, many cities are not very friendly to pedestrians. 
And then in the long run, um, we have impacts on quality of life, uh, livability, and, uh, and sustainability. Maybe I can just briefly define these terms, livability, what do you mean by livability? Well, one is, uh, we, livability and quality of life is more or less the same. Uh, how can we more specifically define that? Um, there are three major elements, components of that. One is the economic viability of the city. If the city is a great problem, doesn't have jobs and so on, deteriorating, that's not a livable city. The second one is to have sound social relations rather than collisions and divisions and so on. And the third one are environmental aspects, which again, environmental, we usually say, what's environmental? Well, that's exhaust and noise. Well, that's only negative. <coughs> we have also positive environmental aspects. So uh, environmental need not always be negative and transportation can enhance environmental situations. So for man-man made environment, the type of city that it is, uh, or it can damage it in the short term. The, uh, uh, you can judge uh, the quality of life and uh, environmental aspects by the fact that in this city, walking through this area, is it something that you want to rush through because it's unsafe, it's unpleasant, it's, uh, it's dirty and so on, or is it an area where you enjoy to get from here to there because you see so many things and meet so many people. That, that really is a, a major element of that livability. Uh, I'll talk later about uh, various obstacles to, uh, to improving transportation. Now let's look a little bit historically in the 20th century when it started. It was the cities around the world were in full swing of increase of population and uh, industrialization. If you look at 19th century, virtually all cities were increasing in size and industrialization, uh, which caused then the uh, the urbanization. What is urbanization? It's the movement of people from villages and rural areas into the cities. So industrialization caused that or accelerated that. And uh, um, that plus the growth, natural growth, resulted in rapid growth of population. The cities in the 19th century, however, were based on humans walking or um, uh, or uh, horse, horse traction, horse carts. Uh, the obstacles of supplying cities were removed when railways were planned, invented since 1825. So at that, through the 19th century, we could now supply fresh food and all that. But the missing link was traveling by people within the city. <coughs> And you couldn't live in one place and work somewhere eight kilometers away. <coughs> so there was a tremendous pressure with growth of city to have dense cities in order to have them serve only by walking. Many inventions were tested how to create some transportation that would be faster, some kind of motors. Starting from steam engines, which were not practical in the city streets, to the winding uh, springs that would pull the vehicle and so on. And then came the big invention. What was the big motor vehicle, the first one that could operate successfully? Street electric streetcar, yes, electric motors. So that was the first one. So the tramways and metros were built. Those initially walking cities were then upgraded because people could travel by train streetcars and and metros not only three, four kilometers, but 15 and 20 kilometers, and three or five or six times faster. So between 1900 and 1950, uh, we developed so-called transit cities, which really allowed people to live elsewhere and work in the city. 
and really allow growth and improve the world. Um, then, from 1930s or so, the automobiles came, a large number of automobiles, and uh, an even bigger change came that mobility of individuals became even better. You could get in the car and go anywhere you want, not only radially, but in any direction. And we created automobile cities, and uh, we had a maximum growth of highways during the 1950s to 1970 period. We invented the field of traffic engineering, which we are doing also now. Um, there was a, a, a rapid increase in mobility, but great problems were created by congestion. So there was a problem then, and as I'll discuss in a few minutes, um, there were studies what to do with this. The automobile is so convenient when everybody drives, it's so convenient, but when everybody drives, the whole system collapses because of congestion. So what to do with the cities? <coughs> if we have low density suburbs, that is handled by automobile easily and walking and so on. If we have large high density cities like Hong Kong, we need to rely much more on public transportation. However, in all kinds of cities, from medium to large, we run into the congestion problems. And they are common in Mexico or in Caracas or in Chinese cities, anywhere you want. It's a very irrational situation which, uh, from which many cities suffer. What to do about it? Um, the reaction was, well, we need wider streets. Right? And uh, we, we then had to build new streets, independent streets, new freeways. <coughs> And then we need more parking. So it, it just went more and more. And finally, cities designed something like this, that uh, freeways come and circle the CBD here. And uh, really, we were projecting that virtually everybody will drive in the future. And uh, this would be the solution. <coughs> this was, however, an example of Edmonton in Canada. In the 1970s or so, they came with this, and the criticism was already very strong at that time. They said, we don't want to destroy the city completely, to have it completely auto-dominated. And the promoter said, well, look at Los Angeles. And they said, exactly. <laughs> we don't want that kind of city. And they, after many discussions, they rejected this and improved some avenues and it built uh, better buses and light rail transit. <coughs> this is where they tried more and more lanes. This is one of Chicago freeways. And uh, first of all, should you build this many lanes next to very high density residential buildings? I don't think you should. Mm -hmm. right? Second, this was left here to build rail rapid transit. Uh, we are intermodal, so we'll combine them. Yes, you're combining it. But you're designing a freeway and putting transit into freeway, which is the least efficient location for transit. When you have a station, even here. When you have a, when you have a station here, if you get out, you have to go 1,500 feet to get to any place you want to go. It's an enemy territory. <laughs> they did build the rail transit, it's better with it than without, but it's not an optimal transit plan. Many highways were just filled more and more as we built. In Seoul, this, this was uh, Sao Paulo, in Seoul you would have 10, 12 lane streets filled with cars. In the last 10 years, this, this picture which I took about maybe 12 years ago from a hotel room down, this would change because Seoul really took a different view now. They even tore down a one freeway going along the river, reorganized, improved buses, and built metro system all over the place. So Seoul has a significant change. This was Los Angeles Center City, this city hall here. 
City Hall. Now, we really can ask ourselves, is this a city and a livable city, or is it a parking lot for the green? So that was the problem that we ran into. So what happened in the 1960s, some cities already experienced, we, we try to widen the streets as much as we can. We want to build some more ways or freeways. Uh, in America, particularly, our industrial system went right came to the cores of cities. In Europe, they at least, in most places, did not bring it right into the core. They terminated uh, maybe three kilometers out or so. Um, but it became obvious that we should have plan rather than patching up, widening this street and building this. And so Los Angeles went for more and more freeways, and then at once they didn't have enough parking. Then they went to build all kinds of parking garages. And uh, Professor Donald Shoup analyzed that, how much good that did and how much damage that did, especially the free parking. Free, you will see in my book, free is always in the quotes, because it means somebody else pays. Free, of course. And you are, you are attracting and stimulating uh, travel into the city by car. Um, so, Britain said, let's have a big picture. What do we do with urban transportation? And they appointed Buchanan, Colin Buchanan, <coughs> he wrote a report on traffic in towns, which was rather popular at that time. He analyzed small city, medium sized city, large city, and historic city. And what to do and how to handle the auto traffic and transit and people and so on. He pointed out correctly that transportation has a tremendous impact on the city and type of city that we have. He said that in small cities it's not a problem of congestion, transit you can have for social services, for people who don't drive and so on. But it's not a big problem. But as the city increases, the problem becomes very big. And he had made a model of a very large city. What would be if most people would come by car? And he says it could be done, but it would not be a good city. It would be just concrete everywhere. Uh, and he suggested that when it comes to that kind of density, we should put more buses to stimulate transit use. Well, Mr. Buchanan really didn't know much about transit. <laughs> because he first ignored all rail. For him, it was buses where transit. And second, he believed that if you have congestion, and you put buses in congested traffic, nobody will leave his car and go to the bus which is even slower. You have to have independent, high quality transit to get some shift. So Buchanan didn't have much impact on, on cities in, uh, in Great Britain. Historic city, they did follow this. Uh, surrounding road and so on, so Nottingham, for example, followed and they were good. Um, in Germany, they appointed an expert, a committee of experts, where they took people with different backgrounds, engineers from transit industry, from highway, from traffic engineers, and economists, and so on. That committee really defined very exactly the role of mobility and the need that all population groups should have some mode of acceptable transportation. That defines by itself that you cannot have car only because you eliminate 30-40% of people and make them second-class citizens. They define that we, we have to accommodate the automobile somewhat more, but we must drastically improve transit and keep and do everything to shift as much travel as possible to transit. They not only saw a very clear picture of these two modes, they were emphasizing livability of cities, not using that word, but quality of life and so on. And they went a step further. If we want that, how do we achieve that and how do we finance that? They suggested gas tax, uh, so and so much per liter. They proposed that and the parliament, the Bundestag, adopted that in 1967. And Germany has had that fund that came from the federal government, matched by uh, local states and cities, and that's why Germany has very nice cities and very multimodal and pedestrian oriented and so on, because they've been doing that now for half a century. Um, what did we do? 
Well, we went with the interstate system planning in the 1950s. 1956 was the interstate system was signed. It's a system we needed not quite as much as, as, as it was designed, but it was financed 90% by federal and 10% by local. So it was very attractive for cities. If they give you a little bit of money, they get all this construction work nine times more. Now you hear criticism how much transit gets from the federal government. Highways got 90 to 10, much more, which highway are people don't emphasize so much. Um, another problem was that interstate was designed just as a system uh, and not as one of the modes that should be coordinated with other modes. The impact of, how, of freeways on the cities was neglected or it was said, well, that will at least clean up the areas. We can tear down this whole block of sands. And those, those relocations were done sometimes ruthlessly without much concern where those people would go. So really just relocating the slums. Um, we had, um, our federal government had nothing to do to help transit from 1956 or all the way up to the late 60s. And then it started having some funds also and gave uh, investment and research and development and so on and the role in transit increased after that. The, the criticism of this single mode planning of the interstate system also resulted in the legislation in 1962 already required by MPOs, Metropolitan Planning Organizations, in every city with over 50,000 and so on. So we legislated that there should be intermodal comprehensive planning, 3C, comprehensive coordination. However, it didn't change the mentality, it didn't change the, it didn't improve the coordination sufficiently. And that came much later. And uh, uh, President Reagan really wanted to stop any help again to transit, wanted to go back to the highway only. But in, 19, in 1990, 91, there was a group, group of senators and legislators very interested in this issue. They organized their teams and they put together so-called ICE team, Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, that says intermodal, that says look at all modes and coordinate them. That ICT, led by Senator Moynihan, is really impressive when you read that legislation. It really gives a lot of professional analysis of different modes and investment versus operation versus impact, services, and so on. Um, so it was a major step forward. Otherwise, you, know, you, read, you read some of the acts that we have sometimes, and it says this should be financed and this, this, and and the bridge from here to here should be financed by 50 million. It looks like a typo. You know, some of these uh, special projects were inserted. ICT was clean, was really professionally done. It was very good. Uh, the overall experience is that uh, relationship of cities and transportation is very complex. The systems approach is necessary. And that there is a need of the two or recognize the quality of life and the ability. So, since the 1970s, slowly, and uh, since the 1990s, faster, uh, we here changed. And of course, by that time, other countries were even ahead in building intermodal cities or intermodal systems where we use different modes and coordinate them. Um, the, it was shown that really intermodal cities offer much more, much better service at lower investment and lower costs. Now what we have today as modes of transportation, we have streets or road system with automobiles, bus buses, that's the basic thing. Walking we should not forget. Walking was forgotten in the 1950s and 60s. We blame children don't walk to schools in many places, they have no sidewalk. We designed pedestrians out of existence from many areas. Usually your older suburbs, towns, have beautiful sidewalks. If you go to new ones, you cannot walk. 
And then we wonder how terrible it is. Every school that we have causes big congestion from all sides. How do we do this? And we run into a circle that uh, the more people, you, you, kids you drive to school, the more traffic there is, so you, you need more driving in order to protect them from their driving. Now California is making a study how to uh, return some of the walking to school to children and make it also more <coughs> interesting for children. Um, so we have walking and we Yeah, then we have bus transit in different forms on the streets, and then we have bus rapid transit. We have tramway and light rail transit. Interestingly, most of the old streetcars or tramways were either closed, changed to buses, or in some cities in Europe, they maintained them and, and modernized them as, as tramways. Uh, even I was skeptical that in the United States, we would get back to the streetcars. Light rail was the future, upgrade and make it faster and so on. Now many cities are building also streetcars because of some of their nice features for Central City. Um, now, in many situations, we had a problem then. Yeah, and then we have Metro of Rapid Transit, Red Rapid Transit, if you remark that here, and Washington Metro and so on. The highest capacity, very effective in large areas. Um, and very easy to compete with the automobile. It's really high quality of service. Regional rail also has been increasing in recent decades. Several cities open new systems. Miami opened, Seattle opened, uh, uh, Albuquerque opened, and, and so on. Because regional rail serves suburban areas, which are growing, uh, and easily competes with the automobile because it's fast and comfortable. And then we have uh, taxes and so on. Um, now, the problem in many cities when they changed streetcars into buses was that they, they paved those tracks even to make lanes to increase capacity. They increased capacity for vehicles, but decreased capacity in terms of people because if you're replacing a rail car by cars, uh, you would need 100 cars to replace one rail vehicle. So it was very counterproductive when they gave up the, the right of way. But the cities found themselves with buses which are low investment, very low investment, but also low performance. It's slow, it's not competitive with a car, it's, it's a stopping at every corner and so on. Now many cities wanted to something better. And around 1970, the only option they knew about was the metro, which is excellent. It will attract people and so on, but extremely expensive. So this is the this is what uh, Atlanta Atlanta was looking at one time for rail. Then they tried. Well, let's just improve the buses, and that showed to be would not be good enough. And then Atlanta finally voted for building for financing back the transit. Seattle also was facing only this and they rejected it's too expensive. Now you see we're missing something that would be much better than this in performance and cheaper than this. We are missing something here. And that medium capacity system has been light rail transit and now also bus rapid transit and automated guided transit and so on. So there has been a lot of development of these medium capacity systems in cities which could not afford metro like Denver, like Portland, like Sacramento, <coughs> about 20 cities here and 100 cities around the world are building light rail and, uh, and uh, uh, having the whole family of modes. So let's see them. Regular bus, ubiquitous everywhere, but not very high service. Articulated bus, double-decker bus, trolley bus, very nice in Switzerland, very nice trolley bus. And then came the busways. This is in Lima, Peru. And in Sao Paulo, they didn't have enough time to build the metro. They built several lines, but they needed something faster also, because the city is 16 million people. And they built this with uh, uh, busways and 
the station stops with, with bypassing. So very, very high capacity. This was the first one really that we can call it BRT. And now BRT is here in Mexico and uh, uh, rather modest here, but uh, a, in, uh, the most famous one is in Transmilenio in Bogota, uh, which, uh, which has uh, been a great improvement over small, disorganized, eight meter long buses that they had before. Now, unfortunately, two weeks ago they had a big rebellion. People were attacking some buses and some because they are jammed, they don't give them enough buses. And they are not giving them enough buses in order to cover all costs out of pocket and so on. So the politics is behind it and they want a better quality of service to this transportation. This is in Los Angeles, BRT, and this is in Boston, a totally mishandled project. <laughs> uh, it's a dual mode, uh, trolley bus and bus, and uh, it goes uh, through the tunnel at uh, maximum 15 miles per hour because uh, you don't have signals, so you're afraid you may have a collision. Uh, Light rail was street cars in the street, and then we separate right away, and whenever we can, and in center city where we cannot separate, we take the same line into a tunnel. So you see, uh, right of way mixed, partially separated, full separated. And the same line, so you can build section by section line, upgrade it, and make it more and more similar to lower capacity uh, uh, metro. This is in Dallas, uh, Dallas. Um, very successful system that they uh, first were very skeptical. Texans are uh, love cars and they are free people and they drive. They don't want the rigidism. It was very well accepted. After two or three lines were built, they voted for hundreds of millions and they want to double the network of light rail. And everywhere where they build light rail, they also improve buses and coordinate them as feeders. This is, you see, the mission. You get all classes of people from the dozing ones to laptop and, and so on. You break that barrier that I don't want to use that bus for various reasons. The rail usually with high quality succeeds in that. Los Angeles builds light rail and metro. Usually you have many bus lines and uh, this would be something like in uh, El Monte, Los Angeles or others. And then you train, yeah, then you rebuild it into rail, light rail. <coughs> what happens, you have to transfer for light rail. But this is what happened in Sacramento. These were buses. <coughs> then they introduced light rail and made good transfer points. And in spite of transferring inconvenience, 30% more took this because it was reliable, frequent, high quality, right into downtown. So this is what happens. This is what happened in so many cities with light rail that really they turned around transit. The vehicles were building, modernizing more and more, and now some cities have even this on the bottom. In San Diego, it's a, it's a very, very long train with very high capacity. Portland, Oregon was multimodal. They improved here not only light rail, but also cars and pedestrians and, and, and uh, uh, environment of the street. Karlsruhe in Germany, in many cities in Germany, the light rail goes right into pedestrian zone and mixes with pedestrians. Of course, it's a slow section, but then the same cars go 50 miles per hour, if you want, outside, and some of them even on railway lines. So these are variations in rail vehicles. Um, advantages of light rail versus BRT, bus rapid transit. <coughs> I don't have time to go through this, but there are a number of advantages. Electric traction, totally clean, compatible with pedestrians and so on. It can go in the tunnels. But some of the bus side is uh, uh, lower investment cost, less complicated to introduce. You can have more feeders and so on. Rapid transit, Toronto, Paris, modernized, Hamburg, whole system modernized. Montreal changed the entire center city when they built metro. Bart in San Francisco, every region <coughs> designed different. Uh, Washington Metro, automated system in Vancouver, regional rail in Paris, 
and now more and more double deckers to provide more seating capacity in regional rail systems. And likely travel regional rail lines have these limits. Now we can say, well, how, what is the rational transportation policy? How do we make it and so on? And these are some elements that you need to really organize transportation. I'll get back to this diagram. The important thing is that we really are, should not be planning only transportation, but really city has the government, the economy, industry, and so on, and transportation is one of those functions. And now, if we look at transportation, how we do it, we can say that at this level four is the single project, single street, single line, and so on, single intersection, that is usually done, planned, and built by the Traffic Engineering Department of Transit Agency. We have expertise, we have financing, and defined role. The second one is once you are working on one bus line, then you say, why don't I analyze the network here and connect that with MARTA trains and so on. So this is now the network or system that is still the single agency, works fine. But then we say, well, if we want to improve really buses and stations and terminals and so on, we should look at traffic also and, tra and, and pedestrian access and so on. So here we become intermodal. And this is where it becomes more complicated because different agencies, different financing sources, and even different expertise. You know, I think we are educating you in transit and traffic engineering and highways and intermodal. But many people are transit people, highway people. And you know what? They not only don't cooperate, they sometimes quarrel. And that's the problem. So that's how, that's what we have to see organizationally, that we find committees which coordinate this, and then we educate you as people who will be intermodal rather than one against the other. And then finally, the most important level is the city and transport balance that this city really is coordinating with these other activities. So in procedural planning, we really should not be starting from small projects and then see what happened. We built one garage, another garage, another garage, and then we see what, what's with the really the city. We should really define the type of city we want to have. And that should tell us about which mode we emphasize and then design the mode in the individual projects. So we know that now individual behavior and system optimum are not the same. If individual behavior prevails, our system is not efficient. And we want to balance that by making transit more efficient, more attractive, and auto less attractive. So we have these two sets of policies of transit incentives and auto disincentives. Now the problem is really rudimentary at the basis is the cost, how much we pay when we travel. And when we travel, say, for an eight-kilometer trip into Center City and parking over the day and so on, we pay really minimum with gasoline, even if it's very high gasoline price, but it's per, per mile, it's really small. We never stop driving one mile to save four cents or whatever. So that's very small. If we pay for parking, that can be substantial, and toll or road pricing can be substantial. But if we have so-called free parking, then we really have cheap travel with that respect. It's even cheaper sometimes than your fares on bus or rail, which doesn't make sense. How common it is? Well, it is like that because we ignore most of the costs. Because the cost that we have, we I paid for my automobile. This is the uh, uh, depreciation of the car. And this is the social cost and congestion cost and so on. This here, AAA estimates, is 85% of cost of driving. And out of pocket is only 15% of driving. So this is, we, we ignore what we already paid. And we don't pay anything. We are not directly affected. <coughs> by the congestion we create, we leave it to the other guy. And that's the, that's the very great problem, that we cause these, these costs and we decide on this basis. 
Um, therefore, that's the rationale for road pricing, for parking charges, for gas tax. Gas tax should be higher. Gingrich would not agree, but <laughs> we should take somebody who knows something about transportation. Um, so, well, many politicians, Gingrich is not the first. McCain and Hillary Clinton was arguing for abandoning gas tax for three months and losing billions of money which we need badly for highway and transit because they don't understand the whole system. So the attempts are for gas tax and, and road prices that we take some of these costs and put them above related to a specific trip. And then there were people with more realistically selected moments. Uh, very uh, time. I'm showing here how um, if you shift some people from transit to automobile, um, I'm sorry, from auto to transit, you gain on transit because you have more riders, you can offer better service. You gain on highways because you have less congestion. So why don't we do that? Because it's not equilibrium. At that time, people would, again, on transit, see that the car is better. So they'll go back to that equilibrium place uh, between the two. So how do we then shift some people? We shift them by those, by those two policies. And this, if you have time later to see, but this, these are the automobile costs. And these are costs by transit plotted from the other ordinate in this direction. And this is the equilibrium. Now, auto disincentives are here. We increase the cost of driving. And transit incentives are here, so that people with these two policies find that they, this is the equilibrium point, and both auto users and drive transit users have better lower cost transportation. But those two policies allow us to make it for people so that they will <coughs> themselves choose them. Um, now, how do the city stand now with respect to transportation? But looking at developing countries, the situation is in most cases very different. They have rapidly increased and growing cities, which we don't have now in Europe, the United States, it's not that much now. But cities in Dhaka and Bombay and Calcutta and, and uh, uh, Cairo and so on, they are increasing. They very often don't have uh, some financing they needed for education, for health, for all of this. They, uh, they don't have expertise. Uh, so they're in a very difficult situation what to do. They can be helped by outside <coughs> organizations for expertise and for finance. Countries in transition, East European countries and former Soviet republics and so on in China, they now, they, they planned as if there will never be many people in cars. So they were planning cities for transit and walking only. Now cars came, they're flooded and congested. So they're desperate what to do uh, about it. Uh, my book, Livable Cities, has now been translated into Russian, and I always get questions in Russia, still very naive, you know, how do we get rid of this condition? How many years will it take that we do it? How much will it cost, and so on? It's really much more complex than that. So they do have expertise in building rapid transit and buses and so on. They have technical expertise. They don't have sufficient expertise in high traffic engineering or in intermodal relations. They are facing that, that uh, uh, problem. Then many cities in industrialized countries, they are still suffering from not sufficient understanding of these problems. And as you know, in Atlanta region or in our states and so on, you can talk about these concepts Many people, many politicians really don't have a good understanding of it. Um, they just, there is a strong opinion, well, like in Mexico and Buenos Aires and so on. Buenos Aires is not an uh, underdeveloped country. But the understanding is not very strong. 
And they simply say, well, when you have a big city and you have high auto ownership, congestion is a natural phenomenon. It's kind of, we have to live with it. So this is the situation you find in many cities. You cannot move much and so on. And uh, you just keep dragging like that. But is it hopeless? Do we just say yes? We have to cope with it. Well, more and more cities are showing us now that we can do a lot about that. We can have a rational system. And that means if you go to several European, North American, and Asian cities, you find that most barriers have been removed and professionally they've done many things. Like in, uh, in Singapore in 1975, they made a plan that they want to charge road users for coming to Center City. They want to improve buses immediately and build a rapid transit now they have an excellent rapid transit system also. They control parking also, they encourage walking and so They were about the first ones that road pricing took 30 years to get adopted by Oslo and Stockholm and London. But I think it's coming in New York where very close to it. Uh, you'll find that also in Oslo and Zurich and Stockholm, Vienna is a really livable city. So when we look at these elements that you need in uh, that you need to <coughs> sorry, that you need to, to make rational policy. You have to understand the problems and define the goals and objectives and what kind of city you want to have. You have to have technical expertise. You have to have political and public support. And that brings usually financing. And then you have to have organization that coordinates all this and you build an operating system. When you look at some of our cities which are hopelessly congested, and you look at Singapore and, and, and Oslo and Munich, you see that these Oslo and Munich have done most of these things very well. So that there is, uh, they are demonstrating that we don't have to say this natural phenomenon to be congested. Uh, highways can be designed better, keep traffic moving. In Philadelphia, we have this huge freeway dividing by 16 lanes the river from the most historic part of the city. After a lot of criticism of that, we managed to build a covered freeway here under this and connect the river. Now we are working on reducing even this barrier and opening up the river more. This kind of garage doesn't help the ability of the city. It's in the core of the city of St. Louis and it's really bad. This was the most congested street in Munich with trucks and trams and cars and so on. They built the the metro, regional rail, underground, and open up the, the uh, network. And this is live 24-7 at all times. It's excellent. Small towns in Germany usually have pedestrian streets now. San Francisco, after they built Park, they rebuilt it much more transit-oriented and pedestrian-friendly. And Toronto built metro system. And this was in 1983. And two years later, this is the city where you see high density around the metro station. So you see, you can see by land uses where the metro stations are, the coordination. Um, so what uh, they have done in most cities, they built excellent metro systems, light rail systems, DRT, uh, umbrella authority, so these are the, and road pricing, I believe, is coming in most cities also. In UK, however, Free market ideology made it that they brought a law that you cannot have one bus company giving information about services of another bus company. So they are legally now destroying what we as professionals are doing to create for the public. Um, and uh, we can say really that uh, transportation, as you can see, is very important for the type of city we want to have. And while technological innovations continue to be important, understanding of problems and introducing innovative policies 
are usually the basic initial steps towards solutions. Really, this is the understanding which goes from the highest level of candidates, from for president and senators, and, and, and we should use all these politicians, politicians means uh, not capable and, and uh, not maybe not very honest in all this, right? Not, it's not so. There are politicians, of course, some who are dishonest in that. But there are many politicians who want to do something, and they need our help. They need help of professionals. And that is important, and that's one of our tasks. Don't only make your models and, and designs, but also talk, look at the whole picture, take the systems approach, and approach the politicians who really need your help to create something like ice tea or so that is professionally sound. That's that's my lecture. And we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much. acceptance of public transit um, because of the subsidies that go into it and everything else. Have you seen any um, innovative methods that policymakers have used to kind of switch the public perception in certain areas? Well, there are many things there. First of all, uh, uh, one of the reasons why we have to subsidize transit is because the costs of driving that, that under the line, nobody pays. Right. So if you explain that we have to reflect that through gas tax, through parking, through peak hour pricing, through various ways, then, and it's interesting, the left-wingers, liberals, would be for improving the system. The right-wingers should be for the principle that user pays you know, so both should agree on that. But when it comes to lobbies, then the ideology is pushed. And we have very strong lobbies on the highway side. Uh, 
you do have to uh, you do have to emphasize uh, intermodal. For example, for Amtrak, it's very often said Amtrak, the federal government has paid forty eight billion dollars for Amtrak. They add up for forty years and compare that with annual investment into highways, which is still higher. And then they were talking about Amtrak should have a glide path to self-sufficiency. If we put that glide path to self-sufficiency, we should close many airports across the country. We should close many interstate highways also. So we, we really have, we have to fight that, those arguments that are not factual and show the full picture. Now, how you finance it, again, you, we need more contribution, more tolls in someone than gas tax. Tolls, popular is, I don't want to pay at all. This is a free country and all this nonsense. You know. But you, you should show them what, if you don't pay tolls, what will your city will look like? Versus if you pay, and then you say, we'll use the toll, but we'll use that money to improve these streets and highways and these transit systems. And you show them the pictures of cities which have done that and how, how they are. Unfortunately, we have to clear out the Senate class with Pigman, but let's thank you.